It's, um, let's get started with prayer. Our Lord and our God, we come before you in Christ to give you thanks for this time that you've given to us. Another day, a Lord's day for us to gather together to worship you. Lord, we ask that as we continue our study in 1 Corinthians, that your spirit will in, um, illuminate us and cause us to see the truth of your word. And we ask, Lord God, that we'll be convinced not by uh, words of man or customs, cultures, or what we see around us, but that we may always be convinced by the word of God. This we do ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 All right, we're going to continue our Bible study on 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in particular uh, verses 2, 2 through 16 on head coverings. Uh, today, we're going to be ta- uh, covering the topics of order, creation, and angels. Order, creation, and angels. So having established last week, and maybe some of you may think I didn't, but having established last week that verse 2, the word tradition, does not mean man-made matters, convention, practice, and custom, but that tradition in verse 2 actually means apostolic tradition in a sense of ordinances and precepts received by the Lord Jesus and delivered to the church, as the word stated in verse 2, we'll now consider the reasons why this is not just a man-made cultural practice, but it is actually a precept given by Christ to be observed in public worship when the church gathers together. So as we saw in verse 2, he praises the church in Corinth for remembering um, to keep the ordinances or traditions that he had given to the church, delivered to the church. And we've seen from scripture that these words are not just matters of convention or culture, but are on on the same level as any other doctrine that's given to the church. Look at verse three. What I will have you know That the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Where else do we find similar language in the New Testament? Ephesians Ephesians 5. Good. Turn with me to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, chapter... um, Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 25. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We're going to interact a little bit more with Ephesians 5, but we see similarity of language here with verse 3. It's a similarity in language. The idea of male headship and of the male being the head of all creation is a, a motive or dominant idea found in the scriptures when the word speaks of the order of humanity. When it comes to the relationship between a male and a female, This is a fundamental truth of the word that the head of a woman is a man. Why and to what purpose? Why and to what purpose is man the head of a woman? Any thoughts? Because it's for the glory of God and God made the man first. So the man was made first. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Luke? Romans chapter 1, out of all things in creation, point to God, does it model the church submitting to Christ and then also submission within the Trinity as well? Yes to the first part, no to the last part. <laughs> but we'll get to that. Uh, Hillary? Um, it's not because uh, one man came from man, like man was first, and then woman was created. Yes, yes. Good. 
Yep. Yes. So all the responses are good and 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 according to the word of God. So one thing in the answers that I don't want anyone to ever um, be confused about or to get into their head and believe this is the case. I want you to always remember that when the scripture speaks that the man is ahead of a woman, it is not because men by nature are superior to women. Okay? To women. Men by nature are not superior to women. Okay? <clears throat> it is not also because they are subordinate to men. Like women are, are, are men are not, or women are not subordinate to men in nature, by nature. Okay? I, I'm making, a, I'm going to make a fine distinction here. Because I know we use these words and interchangeably, but I'm making a fine distinction here. Okay? Women are not inferior to men by nature. Okay? Naturally, biologically, I'm speaking. Okay? Men and women by nature are equal. Men and women by nature are equal. This is why. Men can marry women because by nature we're equal. Okay? This is why when the animals were brought to Adam, none of them were equal to Adam. Okay? This is why none of them were help needs for Adam. Therefore, this verse is not about the essence of a man or a woman. Neither this verse nor in Ephesians 5. Okay? What it is about it are the roles between a man and a woman. The roles. Not their nature, not their essence, but their roles. It's brought out more in Ephesians 5. The role between a husband and a wife. But here in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, it's speaking about the roles just out of the order of things that God has instituted in creation. Here's where radical feminists who hate the Apostle Paul mess up. They focus so much on the first part of verse 3 where it says that the head of every man is a woman. I mean, the, <laughs> the head of every woman is the man. Okay, They focus so much on that that the head of every woman is the man they forget the last part of the verse where it says that the head of Christ is God. It's about roles. It is about roles. This is why, brother, the last part of what you said about in the Trinity is going to, is, wasn't totally accurate. I'll show you in a, in a moment why. Um, and, it, um, and so we need to understand in this context that the head of every woman is man and the head of man is Christ and the head of Christ is God <clears throat> speaking about roles let me ask you this is the son of God by nature inferior to the father anyone disagree with James is the son different than the father in essence no no, no. So, and that's a good answer, because anyone who will say yes, I would question whether they're a Christian, okay? Because if you believe that the son is different or inferior to the father by nature or in essence, then you have a different Jesus, okay? You believe in a different God. So what does Paul mean when he says that the head of Christ is God. What does that mean? There is a distinction here. Notice it. See, I asked whether the son was inferior, not Christ. So the son is not inferior to God. But Christ is inferior to the father. 
See, when we speak of the Son of God, we are speaking of God the Son. The Father and the Son are co-equal and co-eternal. There is no submission as to their nature or their essence. The, um, as the Athanasian Creed states in part, and in this trinity, none is a for or after another. None is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal. Okay? The creed narrows it down further by saying what all Christians must believe. And that is this. That Jesus is equal to the Father as touching his Godhead. And inferior to the Father as touching his manhood. Okay? Christians, do you get offended by what I just read? That Jesus, as to his manhood, is inferior to the Father? How many of you are offended by that? Isn't it then baffling that women will be, will be offended when the scripture says that a woman is inferior to a man? When the scriptures teach that Jesus is touching to his manhood is inferior to the Father. We are okay with that. But why are we not okay when the scripture says that the head of every woman is a man? See, when we speak of Christ, he is inferior to the Father or God in this sense as to his role as Christ. This is what in theology is meant by the economic trinity. Speaking of their roles, not their nature. When it comes to nature, we distinguish it. Um, we distinguish the trinity by calling it the ontological trinity or the trinity as to essence. As to essence, all three are equal. There is no inferiority and there is no subordination. The Son is not eternally subordinate to the Father. Okay? The ESS is a heresy. Okay? The Trinity are co-equal and co-eternal. There's no subordination in the Trinity. However, as to roles, Christ is subordinate to the Father. We see these distinctions all over the Gospels by Christ himself. For example, as to his essence... Christ said, before Abraham was, I am. He spoke of his deity, his divinity. He told the Jews, before Abraham was, I am. He made himself equal to God, and the Jews knew exactly what he was saying. This is why, at the very next verse, they took up stones to try to stone him. However, he, Christ also said, for I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me, at John 6, 38. That is speaking of his role as mediator, as the God man, as Christ. He is speaking of his role there. See, Christ is inferior to the Father in this sense. He is submitting himself to the will of the Father as to his role. And Jesus delights to do the will of the Father. He submits <clears throat> in all things to his Father. And in Ephesians 5, marriage is to reflect these truths. A wife should delight to submit to her husband, which means that the husband should ensure he is also a good husband Worthy of being delightfully submitted to. Right? And of course, as humans, we are to submit to one another in the Lord. In the Lord. <clears throat> the order which God has put in place throughout the scripture never changes. Man is the head of the woman. And therefore, a woman is to understand what her role is as a woman... And the man is to understand what his role is as a man. And when either don't understand their roles, you have confusion. 
We have conflict. And we see this today in our own culture. The head of a woman is the man. The head of man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. And this is all about roles, not about nature. It's a sub subordination of roles, not superiority or inferiority as to nature. Okay? Therefore, in public worship, Paul is arguing that because of this order that's been, that's, that's been put in creation by God that a woman head is the male, and the male's head is Christ, and the head of Christ is God, that therefore a woman should have her head covered in public worship. That is the conclusion to this argument, and he's going to demonstrate this over and over throughout verses 2 through 16. Now, before we consider verses 4 through 6 about prophesying, I want to keep the theme going here and look at verse 7 through 12. We'll go back to verses 4 through 6 at our next Bible study. I'm trying to show you as a connection here to be able to help answer what verses 4 through 6 is actually saying. So let's look at verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So the Apostle Paul makes the first argument of this precept that a woman should have a covering on her head for the argument of order. There's an order that God has put among man. Okay? So a woman should have her head covered because of this order. There is an order of roles given to mankind as there is in the economic trinity. Marriage is an analogy of this truth as we saw in Ephesians 5. What Paul explains in Ephesians 5 is to demonstrate the relationship among married believers regarding the relationship between Christ and the church. We too have Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 making a similar argument as a foundational basis for women to cover their heads in public worship, which is the God-ordained role between male and female. One is the head over the other. Why? Because God has set that order. Why are a married couple to live and act as Paul describes in Ephesians 5? Because that is to reflect the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. <coughs> now Paul goes on to demonstrate this truth and precept that a woman should have a covering on her head from nature. Okay, As man's head is Christ, and therefore to reflect the glory of Christ, it should never be covered in public worship. Because when a man covers his head in public worship, he is covering the glory of God. Yet, who is the glory of man? Just the woman. No, um, yes. The, gl the glory of man is the woman. Yes. Or the glory of the woman is the man. Okay, I'll be my mixed up here. The glory of the woman is the man. The apostle Paul makes the case from creation. Woman is of the man, not man from the woman. Okay? So, glory of the woman is the man. So, her head should be covered because of the glory of man. Okay? We call this historical fact. Eve was created from Adam. Adam was created from the dust. Woman came from man, therefore the woman is the glory of the man. Now recall this other historical fact. For what reason did God create a woman? The woman was created for the man to be his helper. Genesis 2.18, we, we read this. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. God created the woman for the man 
Man was not created for the woman. So this is arguing for nature. Okay? It is not nature as to essence and ontology, but that man came first, then came the woman. And the glory of the woman is the man, because she came from man. So the woman is to have her head covered because the glory that she is exhibiting is man. Okay? Continue in verse 11 to 13. Nevertheless, is the man, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Notice that Paul immediately reminds us that in our nature, ontologically, men and women are equal in the Lord. This is what he's trying, he's trying to remind us, that we need one another if mankind is to live on. So men, males, should never assume a hyper-patriarchal mentality that looks at women as inferior or second class. That we should never look at women as women being there only to cook, clean, and reproduce. Okay? That will be an abuse of scripture. Yet as to Rose, Christ told Paul that a woman is to have a covering to indicate the order God has established between men and women due to the economic role of each and also due to the created order. Okay? So uh, because of creation, because of creation, men come first, women came second, therefore a woman should have a head covering in public worship. Okay? Ver um, so for two reasons, Paul is now establishing that a woman should have the head covered in public worship. The first one is there is an order among mankind. Second reason women should have their head covering in worship is because of creation. The woman came from the man, and the glory of the woman is the man. Okay? There's a third reason now for a woman to have her head covering during public worship, and that's verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. So Paul inserts this verse in between his argument of order and creation. And this reason of the angels is given. And I'll tell you, this is one of the hardest, one of the harder verses to deal with. A lot of people have tried to deal with this verse, and they, some people come up with some weird interpretations. Um, but before we get into the angels part, I want you to look at the first part of verse 10. For this calls out the woman to have power on her head. The word power in, uh, can also be translated as authority. Okay, It's the same Greek word, power, authority, same thing. And so in some English translations, it will say the symbol of authority on her head, which is a good way to bear out what Paul's <laughs> saying, that a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head, okay, because of the angels, okay? Again, when we, he spoke about the order, he says a woman should be covered. When he spoke about creation, he says a woman should be covered. When he's speaking about the angels, he is saying that a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head. So what is that symbol? What is a symbol? What is this figure of speech? Um, Paul is stating that it is a covering, a veil, an actual veil, a cloth covering. Okay? When you read the word covering or covered um, throughout these verses, all the way down until you get to verse 13, thereabouts, the word covering is the same Greek word that is used to cover. I mean, just to cover. Is that what it sounds like, to cover? And when the Old Testament Hebrew is translated into the Greek Septuagint, where it speaks about covering um, uh, furniture of, of God's temple is the same word as covering. Okay? It's the same word. It's an actual veil, an external covering. This is why the argument that the hair is the covering isn't a legitimate argument from the text. 
according to the original language of Greek. Okay? Because when it gets down to where it says, for a hair is given for a covering, that's a different Greek word for covering there. Different Greek word. Okay? So up to this point, Paul is arguing that an external cloth covering is that symbol of authority that should be on her head. Okay? All right. Now, there, notice the progression here. Apostolic tradition that Paul received from Jesus, he delivered to Corinth. They were praised for practicing it because they were in agreement in their practice with all the churches of Christ, as we see in verse 16. He gives them a reason why, because of order, because of creation, and because of the angels. This is why a woman is to have a symbol or a, a, of authority on her head, which is a cloth veil or a hat or something on her head as a symbol of authority. And just as God chose the sign of covenant, belonging, in the Old Testament being circumcision, in the New Testament being water baptism, he also appoints a symbol for women here. It's his prerogative, right? It's his prerogative. So what about the angels? Why, why, why should a woman cover because of the angels? And the reason is because they are a witness of this submission. They're witnesses of this submission. The angels here in verse 10 does not mean the ministers of the gospel. Some have interpreted it that way. doesn't mean that. Neither does it mean demons, okay? There's, I'm telling you, there's Pentecostal churches out there that will say that is speaking of demons here. It's not speaking of demons, okay? The angels here are those spiritual beings which do the bidding of the Lord and actually interact with humanity as the Lord directs them to do. You see, brothers and sisters, when, when I pronounce uh, the call to worship in public worship, that is an indication that public worship has officially begun. It is God himself calling you, the assembly, and church of the firstborn to render worship to Jehovah. The call to worship is an element of worship and is purposely done. Okay? The call of worship is not some man-made tradition that's handed down throughout church, the church age or for us to do because it's neat. There is a specific reason for the call of worship. It's God calling you through the pastor to worship. To worship. It's not a matter of convention. If the call of worship was a matter of convention, then we wouldn't do it because we hold to the regulative principle of worship which teaches that nothing is to be done in public worship if it's not authorized by God. Okay? So the call of worship is authorized by God. So when I do the prayer invocation, which is the prayer after the call of worship, I'm actually calling upon God to come and be in our midst in a special way way okay god is everywhere i the you know the children were asking me is god here and at home and over there in my friend's house and yes god is everywhere but when we call on him in prayer in worship he comes into our midst in a very special way guess who else is present when we worship the angels, the angels of god exactly the angels of God are present when we worship. God tells us as much when we gather to worship that not only is Jehovah present in a special way, so are the angels. When we worship, the angels of God are present. Turn with me in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 22. But ye, plural, you all, are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, 
and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Brethren, when we gather for worship, this is what is happening. You may have noticed when my prayer of invocation, I'm saying, take us up, Lord, into the heavenly places where we worship with the invisible church, with all the saints. This is what I'm referring to. When we gather together for worship, we're worshiping with the invisible church and with an innumerable company of angels. This is why worship is to be reverential and to be dignified. It's not comedy hour or a TED talk. And, and John Owen himself, when he goes here and uh, comments on Hebrews, he compares this to Psalm 68, 16 through 17, that the church is a holy hill and that uh, a Zion and that the angels are present because this is referring to Psalm 68 as well. And so this is what I'm praying for when we come to worship, to be present. But where else do we find this truth that the angels are present with us when we worship? It's found in the Old Testament. The Old Testament tells us that when we come to worship God, the angels are present. You see, before I move on, let me ask you a question. Do we believe that in worship we should have images of God? No. No, right? No images, right? We're Reformed Presbyterians. We're, we, are, we, we believe in the right to principle. We're Protestant. We, we're the ones, you know, our spiritual ancestors, you know, broke the images, right? But did you know that God had King Solomon carve images of angels around the temple? Did you know that if you paid attention when we were doing an Old Testament reading, that God had told um, um, Israel in the wilderness to have images of cherubim, which are angels? Where are the cherubim in the tabernacle? Oh, no. Yeah, the mercy seat, right? Right? And what, how, what, you know, their, their wings are pointed this way and their heads are bowed down, right? Okay. First Kings chapter 6, verse 23, and then verse 29 says this. <clears throat> All within the oracle or the inner sanctuary, he, King Solomon, made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. And he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers within and without. What was all around the temple? Carved images of cherubims. Why? Why were cher cherubims? Why was there uh, uh, two cherubims made of olive trees ten cubits high on the mercy seat. You know, one cubit is 10, 10, uh, 12 inches. Okay, do the math. Pretty big. Luke? I'm probably going to get it half right again, but um, they're witnessing, but they're also pointing to God. Yes. And when we worship, we don't worship alone, right? Mm -hmm. We don't worship alone. When there is an assembly of the church, not only are people assembled, but also the angels are assembled. This is why we are being taught, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, that when we come to worship, there are angels present. You had your hand up? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this is another reason why the Apostle Paul is making an argument that women, whose head are men, ought to have a symbol of, authority, of that authority upon their hands. Because not only is God present, but so are the angels in the public assembly. You see, we read, you know, if you, if you, um, if you know anything about evangelism, you know this. 
what happens when one sinner converts? Exactly, right? What is a primary means of grace? What is a primary means of the call of the gospel? You guys remember? Before guys? Preaching of the word. Preaching of the word from where? From the pulpit. From the pulpit. Right. So when a, a, uh, so the context of that verse is that when a sinner converts from the preaching of the word from the pulpit, angels rejoice. And where is that preaching of the word happening? Public worship. Because the angels are present. 1 Peter 1.12 reads in part like this. And it speaks about the angels again. Enjoying, they actually listen to the preaching of the word. 1 Peter 1.12 says, Unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. See, they listen to the preaching of the word as well. They Rejoice when a person is converted from the preaching of the word. Think about it. They are, they are, the angels, all they live for is to worship and to serve God. They know what man is. Sinful, wicked, corrupt. And to see the sinful, wicked, and corrupt now worshiping the God they worship is... But it more mind-boggling for them than than we sh than we should realize, right? We should be more mind-boggled than they <laughs> that we who are wicked sinners, God save. So the angels are present in our <clears throat> worship services. They enjoy hearing Christ preached, and they praise the Lord with us. This is why Paul says, "For this reason, then ought a woman to have her head covered." Because it demonstrates her role as to order. It demonstrates that they are from and for men in relation to creation. And because the angels are present in public worship, observing our conduct. Paul argues that when women are uncovered in public worship, not only is Christ witness to this usurpation of order and creation, so are the angels. They are witnessing this. Therefore, Paul is saying that the woman's head is to be covered to demonstrate their acceptance of their role in the created order and to ensure that Christ's glory alone, Christ's glory alone is uncovered in the public worship of God. And who is Christ's glory in public worship? Men. Right? We, glory, we are head, the man's head is the glory of Christ. So it should be uncovered in public worship. So, the progression of the argument of Paul here in 1 Corinthians 11 is this. A woman's head should be covered because of order between, among human, humans. The woman's head in public worship should be covered because of creation. The woman is from man. And um, the woman's head should be covered in public worship because the angels are present. And the angels are about order and decorum. And they're the ones that are in the presence of God. And what do we learn about the angels who are in the presence of God? How many wings do they have? You guys remember? Was there... And what are one pair of wings doing? They cover their face. Why? Because they're in the presence of God and His glory. Right. Then the other wings, I think, cover their body. Their yeah. Wings. For them to move around, right? Yeah. So, if they cover, Paul's saying women are to cover. Right? Because of this order. So the head of the man is Christ, right? And so the head of the man should not be covered because he's exemplifying Christ in that sense, his glory. Okay, so this is the progression of the argument, okay, that Paul is giving from these three um, 
ways. So it could have been anything else to show this um, position of roles between men and women. God could have chosen anything else to represent this symbol of authority. He, but God chose a cloth covering, an, uh, an external type of covering. Just like he could have chose anything as a symbol of our inclusion in the covenant community, he chose circumcision in the Old Testament, he chose baptism in the New Testament. The same thing, he could have chose anything to demonstrate this order among humanity for a woman, but he chose a cloth covering as a symbol of authority to be on her head. Okay? Uh, next time, I will get into the part of prophesying about hair and then the actual covering more into detail. I just want to lay out more of the progression of this argument. Now, end here, and then we'll turn off the recording, and then 